Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thank you guys for joining us for what should be a stacked episode. We've got the former 154-pound king, Swift, Jared Hurd, joining us. Undefeated welterweight prospect, Vito Mel Nicky Jr. will be stopping by as well. Plus, we're going to recap all of last weekend's action. And in this week's toe-to-toe, we're going to take a look at three of the most questionable decisions in boxing history. You've got Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad, Bernard Hopkins versus Jermaine Taylor, the first fight, and Manny Pacquiao versus Timothy Bradley, also the first fight. But first, a couple memorable boxing anniversaries this week. March 1st, 1992, the warrior from Africa, Ghana's Azuma Nelson, also known as the Professor, took on Jeff Fennick in their anticipated rematch. The first fight, which occurred uh, eight months earlier in Las Vegas, was a draw, although many felt Fennick deserved to, to win. The rematch took place in Fennick's native Australia, open-air stadium in Melbourne, rainy, 37,000 people in attendance, all to witness Fennec's coronation. I mean, it was a foregone conclusion. Instead, Nelson cemented his Hall of Fame credentials with a brilliant performance, stopping Fennec in eight rounds. Turned out to be the, the Ring Magazine upset of the year for 1992. Mike, I have so many great memories of that man and of that night. It's it's kind of weird to think of that as an upset, you know, in retrospect. In retrospect, yeah. Yeah, because in retrospect, it's not an upset at all. Um yeah, great. Uh, Azuma Nelson, great, great fighter. Um, I got to see him fight a couple of times myself. Um, the first time was at, was on the undercard of Julio Cesar Chavez and Greg Haugen in front of 126,000 people <laughs> at uh, Estadio Azteca in Mexico City. So that was real special. And my boy Gabriel gave him a good fight. He, he lost a, a close decision. And, and, I, and I ran into to Azuma a few times. Uh, I was able to talk to him a few times. Uh, over the years and he always struck me as uh, a quiet guy but a gentleman a real real just a nice nice guy i remember he kept saying i fight for my babies i fight for my babies which which wow. i really appreciate he's obviously a family man that that's what motivated him yeah indeed he he was a family man and and he was an icon to so many Ghanaians, whether you're a boxing fan or not. Uh, obviously, my, my background is from Ghana. And, and March 1st, 1992 was probably the, the day when I became a boxing uh, fanatic. I was a little kid, and it was my uncle's birthday. Uh, so myself, my family, obviously my dad drove over to his place, in, to my uncle's place in Brooklyn. And I remember that the party was just dead. Like, I remember sitting there an hour in, and there were about three or four people just hanging around. And my dad kept leaving the apartment and coming back then at one point he called me to join him and then i realized that my uncle's neighbor who was also from ghana like the rest of us his next door neighbor had showtime and everyone was at his apartment watching the nelson fennec rematch so there were so many people in the apartment i couldn't tell you how many but it was a little brooklyn flat and the floor was literally sagging under the weight of these people i mean it was scary i've never seen or felt anything <laughs> like that before and it was bedlam when nelson won everyone went back to my uncle's place i they partied all night extremely happy and i became a boxing fan after that as much as i was of uh you know baseball football tennis golf at that time until eventually uh boxing surpassed them all i've met uh, azuma several times since then and he is a as you would describe him so humble so calm just a national tre treasure you know beloved by his his people and on that night he was king of the boxing world that's a great story i love that story yeah, yeah. Now, another special anniversary and also a, a great night uh, occurred March 1st, 2003. Undisputed light heavyweight king Roy Jones Jr. moved up to heavyweight and won a portion of the heavyweight title with a unanimous decision win over John Ruiz. Mike, what an accomplishment and what a magnificent performance that was. Absolutely. Um, I was fortunate enough to be there. I was there, you know, leading up to it on fight week. Uh, special, special time. Um, yeah, he's fighting the guy who 
uh, we were talking about this earlier. You know, a guy who started at 54 is moving up to heavyweight to fight. A, he isn't the greatest heavyweight in the world, but he's a pretty good heavyweight, uh, John Ruiz. He was he was a capable guy. Uh, we are what's going to happen when Jones gets hit by a by a by a heavyweight and he takes a heavyweight punch. This is a really really uh, big challenge for a guy like that. Well, come fight time, it was just utter domination. You know, sure. in terms of speed and ability and athleticism, I mean, Ruiz was just clueless. He just had no idea how to handle this guy, and he couldn't. Um, so anyway, you, you look at the, just the the scorecards, and it was very one sided for a reason. Uh, Jones completely dominated that fight. It was a a pretty remarkable performance. But let me add let me add this: is when I think when I think back at that fight, I think of that Jones sort of sold his soul to the devil because he was never the same after that fight yeah he certainly wasn't but you know getting back to that fight first uh, Roy Jones beating a top five heavyweight and I say that because a lot of people say well Ruiz was a paper champion Lennox Lewis was the real heavyweight champion and that's fine if you you know wish to see it that way but the bottom line is that Roy Jones Jr. who started his career at 154 pounds won titles at 160 168 and 175 at the age of 34 moved all the way up to heavyweight two more divisions and beat a top five contender at worst in that division that's i mean that's no small feat in fact i think that's magnificent now if roy jones had retired then and i and i still believe people most boxing fans think that uh he's one of the greatest uh, of this era and and perhaps pound for pound on any given night, I'd probably choose him to beat any other fighter um, in history. But if he had retired, then how much bigger would he be, uh, you know, compared to what transpired afterward? I, the, the thought alone is just scary. Yeah. Well, yeah, it'd be like a mic drop. It would be like the perfect time to go out, but who does that? And, you know, nobody yeah. does, does that. I keep thinking, I keep going back to Carl Frotch who knocked out um, George Groves with one punch in front of 80,000 people at Wembley stadium and just retired. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not many guys, not many people do that guys go out on wins, you know, but not, not, not on a huge, huge win like that. It just doesn't happen. And then I, you know, ironically, 15 years later or whatever it is, uh, Jones is, Still fighting. Still going on. Yeah. Still in search of, of of still attempting to recapture what he lost that night against Antonio Tarver. And I do think that that moving down in weight from heavyweight to light heavyweight certainly hurt him. I also yeah. feel like he was already slowing down. Uh, he's been really flat-footed in, in the light heavyweight fights prior to his moving up. I thought his speed had slowed just a tick. And that's really all you need in boxing. And I also think that... You go back down from you go from heavyweight back down to light heavyweight, and then you take on Antonio Tarver in your first fight. And folks, forget that first bout was a grueling twelve rounder where he took a lot of heavy shots to the head and body, particularly some big left hands to the head, and I, that I, I feel were, were just as strong as the ones that he took in the rematch. I feel like that took a lot out of him as well. And then we saw what happened in the rematch, and and you know the rest obviously is history, but still a great night for Roy Jones Jr. And we have a great show ahead of you guys. It is time to bring in our first guest this week, fresh off a terrific third round knockout last Saturday on Fox. He is a rising undefeated welterweight prospect and boy, does his future look bright. Vito Melnicki Jr. First things first, uh, Vito, assess your performance for us on Saturday night. Yeah, um, I thought I performed very well. Um, it was my first eight-rounder and my first time on uh, Big Fox. Um, and I got a step-up fight opponent, the guy with 10 wins, only three losses, out of there in three rounds. And um, I felt sharp and I felt I felt very strong. So. Yeah, you look strong and you look noticeably bigger on Saturday night, even though it was the same weight. Did you did you feel any different? Um. I wouldn't say I felt different. I actually, I just felt like a lot stronger. I felt a lot more, uh, just, I felt better. I would like, I just felt like great. I don't, at 47, I came down the right way. My weight eating right. Um, mm. and just everything was, was perfect. Um, my weight came down right. My hydration went, was great. And, um, my body felt phenomenal once I got in the ring. How much longer do you think you'll you'll be at 147? Yeah, um, I could make 47 easy when I'm when I uh like obviously we do it right, so I make 47 easy. 
but obviously, like you said, you could tell my size difference. I got a lot bigger. I got taller. And um, who knows how many more fights I'll be at 47, but assuming my next fight is going to be at 47, we don't know how many more we're going to be at 147, though. So, T- Taller is an interesting concept. Do you feel like you're growing? Uh, yeah, I do feel like I'm growing. Um, I don't know how many, how much more I'm going to grow, but, um, definitely feel like I'm growing. Uh, I grew like two inches while I was out in LA. So, um, who know? Yeah. We don't really know how much more I'm going to grow, but I, I hope I keep growing. Who knows? (laughs) You're going to end up being a heavyweight. Um, how, 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 how tall are you now? I'm actually six foot. So I finally reached six foot and, uh, yeah, I'm feeling great. That's interesting. Uh, so you moved on from trainer Joe Goosen because you wanted to be closer to home, uh, which is understandable. Yeah. But you did spend six months there. What impact did he have on your on your career and your development? Oh, yeah. Um, Joe, he's a great trainer. I learned so much in the six months inside and outside the ring with Joe Goosen. Um, obviously, he's brought many guys to the top. And uh, he knows what it takes to get there. So just being in the presence of someone like Joe, uh, you can't really ask for much more. Just his knowledge overall, when you just speak to him, he he rubs off on a person. So um, he definitely, the, my experience out there was, it was great. I think I grew as a, as a man and as a fighter as well. I know what you're saying. I've known Joe for twice your lifetime. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so... For those who don't know, what can you tell us about your current trainer, Muhammad Abdul Salam, and the history that you guys share? Yeah, I mean, me and Muhammad, we go back since I was seven years old. Um, I His son, uh, we call him Odie. Uh, he plays football, but he's also a boxer. He's playing football at Western Michigan. Uh, we grew up together in boxing in Jersey, and we traveled around the country together. And our connection, it's like – we've known each other forever so it's just like he knows me just like how my dad knows me he knows he knows my what I do good what I do bad he knows what I like what I don't like and um going back with him I was only with him for two weeks uh up leading up to the fight I actually left LA like two or three weeks before the fight and uh we didn't skip a beat because we've known each other and we've been together for so long Fantastic. Uh, so how often do you want to fight this year? How many more times do you want to fight this year? Have you thought that out? Uh, probably three times, three or four more times uh, for sure. Um, just Al Heyman, he's moving me right. They're putting me on the biggest platforms, and uh, I want to uh, continue that in 2021. Obviously, I fought on mainstream Fox in my first eight-rounder. It didn't go eight rounds, but 18 years old fighting in an eight-round fight is – um. Not many 18-year-olds are doing that, so I can't thank Al Heyman and PBC enough for what they, how they've been moving me, and uh, I can't see, can't wait to see what's in store for 2021. So you, you just kind of alluded to my next question. I mean, you had a lot of offers on the table prior to joining PBC. You mentioned mm-hmm. exposure being a big reason why you made that decision. So how does it feel now? Uh, you mentioned being on Fox and so forth to, to be on network TV so early in your career. Yeah. Um, Obviously, we knew what we uh, we knew what Al Heyman and PBC brought to the table. We knew they had the platform, but most importantly, they brought me in as family from day one, and um, they treated me just like family. And um, being on the on Fox as an 18 year old, and being on FS1 and all my other fights with Al, uh, not many fighters are doing that, especially during a pandemic. So. Um, I'm just blessed to be in the position I am that I'm in, and uh, I'm happy that I'm with the best in the game, Al Heyman. Now, speaking of fighters on TV, who are some of the boxers you watched and admired when you were growing up? Yeah, um, some of the guys I watch now are Canelo, Roberto Durant, Floyd Mayweather, um, Andre Ward. So those are some of the guys I watch. It's a strange concept to hear somebody say they they followed Canelo growing up because yeah right it's different. He, seem, he still seems young to to me um, yeah yeah so you had you had a successful very successful amateur career during that time did you fight anyone who's a pro now that we would know um I fought well Jalil Hackett he's turning pro soon um I fought 
uh, I never fought Xander, I, but I've sparred with everyone. Like most of the guys that are that are young and up and coming, I sparred with. I grew up with uh, Gervonta Davis in the amateurs. I grew up with Score Stevenson, um, Josue Vargas, Edgar Berlanga, uh, Chris Colbert. Grew up with him. I grew up with everyone in the amateurs since I was seven years old. So um, those are just some of the guys that I grew up with, and I was in the gym with growing up, and just was in the, like in a boxing environment growing up with throughout my whole life. So uh, those are some of the guys, just to name a few. Right. Well, you, you just spoke directly to my next question. So you, you spar with a lot of guys that we know, um, including Julian Williams, I understand. Are there any sessions yep. in particular that like stand out to you that were just crazy or, or just really jump out in your memory? Yeah, I mean, sparring for me, um, I never really, sparring is just really all learning and just, working on things in sparring. I'm I never really go into a sparring session trying to win the sparring just because right. that's not what sparring is for and um mm-hmm. but the experience with being in the ring with Julian Williams, like I said, I being in the ring with a guy of his caliber I don't even consider it sparring. I consider it uh just like an education just because I'm in the ring, he's teaching me stuff and I'm just feeding off what he's showing me and uh I think we did six I think eight round six or eight rounds together and uh the things that I learned in that sparring I'll take throughout my whole career and to this day that and that was like a year ago so I'll still remember oh. everything that I learned and um just being in a ring with a guy like him you just learn just by what he does you just watch what he's doing wow you brought up Javante Tank Davis, who always speaks highly of you. Did you guys spar before, or was it just you knew each other from the amateur ranks? No, we never sparred before, but we, we did a lot of traveling together, uh, 19 hours in a van to Tennessee together. Um, oh. Just being – I always – my first, like, 20 fights were in Baltimore, Philly, and uh, they were all in his gym, uh, Calvin Ford, up in boxing in Baltimore, and um, – I have pictures of when uh, I was I was shorter, real uh, little, and t- Tank was older, and I was shorter than Tank. Now I'm taller than Tank, so uh, it's just it's cool to see uh, someone like him who came from nothing and uh, just came through the amateurs just like I did, and see where he's at now. It's uh, it's an inspiration, so it's really it's cool. That's awesome. I mean, to yeah. you know, you, now you're a professional. You have eight pro fights now. Where do you feel you've most improved? Yeah, um, definitely just in the ring. My boxing, how poised I am, how I'm being more patient. I always had that uh, style, even in the amateurs, of uh, being too patient in the amateurs because you only have three rounds. So I knew that that would always benefit me in the long run in the pro game. But um, really just my poise in the ring, my... um. My composure, just uh, just if I get a guy hurt, to take my time, don't rush things, and uh, just letting the fight come to me and settling into the fight, I think, is what is most important in the pro game. And last question. You mentioned you wanted to fight three or four times this year. When can we expect to see you back in the ring? Uh, should be I'm – gonna, I'm already getting back in the gym this week, so give my body a little bit of time to rest uh, for a few days, but I'm getting back in the gym. Um, hopefully soon, hopefully, uh, late May, early June around there, maybe early, early May, late April around, who knows, probably around there. Well, we can't wait to see you Vito again. Congratulations on that performance Saturday night. You looked fantastic and we look forward to, to having you back on the show again soon. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. It's time for the week in review, and we're going to start last Saturday. Fox PBC Fight Night returned with the WBC World Super Middleweight title eliminator in the main event. Two-time champion Anthony Durrell against Karan Davis. Durrell was a big favorite going in, but Karan Davis came to fight. After 12 rounds, it was ruled a split draw. Mike, before we get into the decision, let's start with the fighters themselves. What did you think of the fight and each fighter's performance? I thought Durrell demonstrated that he still has fight left in him at 36. I thought he boxed pretty well. Uh, his speed, his reflexes, the way he moved in the ring, uh, I think he looked he looked pretty good. Uh, he probably could have been a little bit more active, uh, which maybe would have given him the decision. But, you know, as it was, I actually had him winning 115-113, uh, seven rounds to five. Uh, I thought Davis looked good, too. 
uh, he demonstrated that he could uh, demonstrate in that fight that he could uh, handle an elite opponent, uh, you know, fight him on roughly equal terms. Uh, I thought he was a little too bouncy and a little too inactive early in the fight, but he ended up outworking Durrell, I thought. Uh, his problem might be his lack of power, uh, both in that fight and going forward, but still, I thought I thought he, sh- he showed that he belongs among the better uh, fighters in that division. Yeah, he certainly did. Now, what about the decision? Obviously, both fighters feel they won, and I saw a lot of different opinions online as well. I don't want to sound wishy-washy. I thought it was a close fight that could have gone either way. <laughs> so, I, so I'm okay with the decision. You know, I gave Durrell the nod because I thought he landed the heavier shots. And I agree with uh, Durrell that a lot of Davis's punches did hit Durrell's gloves, which shouldn't really count in the scoring. But still, it wasn't a robbery or anything like that. I thought it was no. essentially an, an even fight. One guy outworked the other guy, and the second guy landed the heavier shots. That's the way I saw it. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. And I thought Davis impressed for his first fight at 168. He certainly surprised a lot of people. Where does he go from here? Well, that was like a victory for Davis, I think. Uh, You know, he's moving up in weight. He'd never taken part in a high-profile fight like that. Uh, As I suggested earlier, I think he became a player in the division as a result of uh, of a draw. Uh, I think he's now a legitimate opponent for pretty much anybody. Yeah, I I tend to agree. Now, what about Durrell? This fight was a WBC title eliminator. Obviously, that is now on hold. What do you foresee for him? See, that's the question now with Durrell. He's in a tough position. Uh, He obviously was hoping a victory over Davis would lead directly into a title fight. You know, he even said he didn't want to face the winner of the Benavidez Ellis fight, the other uh, title eliminator. He didn't want to face that person. He wanted to go directly into a title fight. So now what? Now that you have a draw, you know, what do you do? Obviously, you know, with Durrell, you know, his name, he's a viable opponent for anybody at any time. He, he's hes built that sort of reputation. But he's 0-1-1 in his last two fights now. Uh, I might, It might take a win or two for him to earn that title shot that he wants. Now, the question is, at his age, does he want to do that? Now, that's up to him. Yeah, it is. And I guess we'll see what's what's next for him. Perhaps a Caleb Plant fight opens up. You never know in, in this sport, but certainly this was not the outcome he was looking for. In the co-feature, unbeaten prospect Jesus Ramos stepped up to welterweight from 140 and continued to look spectacular. Ramos scored a second-round knockout over Jesus Emilio Bajorquez. Mike, what were your thoughts on Ramos's performance? I thought he looked terrific. Uh, I'm going to say the same thing about Vito Milnicki uh, and Rivera and Michelle uh, Rivera, too, uh, although Rivera is a little bit older. I'm impressed. I'm just so impressed with the poise that these kids have at their age. Uh, They look like seasoned fighters out there. Uh, I thought Ramos was patient. He was always in control in this fight. Uh, And then when he when his punches touch his opponents, they just do a certain thing. Um, He hurt his opponent and then and then finished him just like that. It's another spectacular knockout. Um, I just love this guy all the way around. Yeah, I I think he's an excellent, excellent fighter. Kid's only 19 years old, clearly beyond this level. Who would you like to see him face next? Well, I think you know me by now. I I go approach these these things sort of conservatively. He, He only has 15 fights. He's only 19 years old, as you mentioned. He's only had 35 professional rounds, believe it or not. That's like nothing. Um, Take your time. Uh, He could probably handle a fringe contender right now, uh, but I would wait a little bit on that. Uh, I would find more guys like this opponent, uh, guys who have some experience, guys who are tough, guys who are going to fight so Ramos can get some more rounds. Uh, It's just a matter of building up that experience with him because before you know it, he is going to be fighting top guys. Yeah, he mentioned after the fight, Ryan Carl or Antonio yeah. DeMarco as yeah. possible opponents. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, those are hard fights. Carl, maybe um, DeMarco right now. You know, he might be able to handle both those guys, but that's a big step fighting a guy yeah. like DeMar- DeMarco. Um, I personally, if I'm his manager, based on what I know, I'd say let's wait a couple more fights. But yeah. listen, he could fight a guy like that and win, and then he's that much closer to where he wants to get. Yeah, I could see him maybe closing out the year with a guy like that. Maybe. And then, you know, moving into next year, into you know, start looking at the contenders and, and a world title toward the end. I mean, he's 19, you know, so I, I don't time. think there's, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's much of a rush. In the Fox televised opener, another teenager, Vito Melnicki Jr., who we just spoke to, also looked fantastic. Melnicki stopped Noe Lopez in three rounds. It was supposed to be a step up, his first eight-rounder, and Mike, I thought he looked better than ever. He looked 
He looked good. Uh, you know, as was mentioned in the interview uh, with Vito, um, he looked big and strong in there. I can't believe he's grown two inches. That's just yeah. wild. I mean, when does, uh, who knows when that stops? I mean, right. we, we don't know how big this guy's going to end up being. Uh, anyway, like Ramos, he looked like a veteran in there. Uh, for example, he put Lopez down. When Lopez got up, uh, uh, Milnicki didn't go crazy. He attacked, but in a, a responsible way, and then he finished the job in the next round. Mm-hmm. Um, this kid has a lot, a big, big upside, um, just like just like Ramos, I just love this kid all the way around. Yeah, me too. I think both those guys have a, a bright future. Melnicki has only eight pro fights now. How far away is he from fighting, you know, the journeymen or the gatekeepers, French contenders and uh, and so forth? What's your take? I, you know, and I didn't put this in my notes. I I think he only has 23 rounds, professional wow. rounds under his under his belt, which, again, is, is, is nothing. I would take a similar approach to Ramos. Um, I would just move slowly here, and I think that's what his handlers have, have in mind. Uh, I think he's probably a couple years away from be- before we could even start talking about a title fight. Uh, but as far as like a fringe guy, you know, he might only be three or four fights away from something like that. Uh, but again, yeah. I would ask, what's the hurry? He's 18, just turned 18? Um, you know, what's... <laughs> What's what's the hurry? Um, let let him continue to develop. So when the opportunity comes, that he's really truly ready for it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you know we saw a lot of good prospects this weekend in the main event of the Fox PBC Fight Night prelims on FS1. Michelle Rivera moved up from lightweight to pretty much welterweight, and he might have been the most impressive PBC fighter this weekend. I don't know. Rivera stopped Anthony Marcato in eight rounds. He's a little older than the other prospects we're discussing. Twenty two. Yeah, um, hard. Can't believe I'm putting older in 22. An old man. In this, yeah. yeah, in the same sentence. What was your take on what you saw from Rivera? The thing that always strikes me about Rivera is how smoothly he boxes. It's just very pleasing to watch. Um, it's like he's a beautiful boxer. Uh, he obviously has the goods, you know, as he demonstrated again. He can box. He's got heavy hands, which isn't the first thing I think of, but they're there. Uh, he's got poise like the others. He's got poise beyond his age. He's only 22. He's a kid, too. Uh, I thought he just looked terrific um i want to say just generally it's fun to watch these guys to see the talent watch them begin to blossom yeah. and think about what might lie ahead and i look forward to when they have tougher tests the kind that will bring their you know that'll bring their potential into even better focus yeah for sure who would you like to see rivera face next you know as you just said, Rivera is farther along than than the other two. You know, he's ranked by two sanctioning bodies, which means the title shot isn't that far off. Uh, I don't think he's quite there yet, although I guess he wouldn't pass up a title shot. I'm, I'm thinking guys like, and when I say, I'm going to mention some names, it's mostly guys like at this level, like a Diego Magdaleno and Arginus Mendes, yeah. Yuri Orcas Gamboa maybe uh, for Rivera, sort of a, a, a guy that people know would be a good stepping stone to where he wants to get, that kind of thing. Yeah, those are good matchups. You know, I don't know if he's even if he's quite ready for that level. He he probably is, but I still would take, you know, a fight, a fight or two in between. But hey, I mean he's blowing by this level of opposition. So it's good. Um yeah, yeah. clearly the kid the kid's yeah. got the goods. Now also last weekend we witnessed the return of unified world super middleweight champion Canelo Alvarez against mandatory challenger Avni Yildirim. As expected, Canelo made quick work of Yildirim, stopping him in three rounds. What were your thoughts on the fight, if you, if you want to call it? Well, yeah, fight, put the fight in quotes. Uh, I thought Alvarez was great, as usual. Uh, I thought the matchup was disgraceful. Uh, Alvarez obviously had his way with the guy until it was over after three rounds. Um, it was another strong win. They kept, they kept him busy ahead of his title unification bout with Billy Joe Saunders, which we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, honestly, though, I hated the fact that that the system of mandatory challenges dictated that Alvarez had to, to fight a guy like this. Uh, Yildirim just had no business in the ring with, with Alvarez. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have the tools or the mental toughness. He was sort of like a deer in headlights, I think, uh, which played a big role in his quick, played a role in his quick demise. Uh, bottom line, I can come up with 15, 20 guys he should have fought before Yildirim. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, obviously, I don't think Canelo Fear is getting in the ring with anyone. He's just doing what, you know, he's been mandated to do. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wasn't surprised. I don't think anyone was surprised by the outcome, given what, you know, Chris Eubank Jr. did to Yildirim years ago. But now Canelo is slated to face WBA 100, WBO 168-pound titleist Billy Joe Saunders in May. What's your take on that fight? Well, 
It's a better matchup, obviously. Um, Saunders is an experienced guy who I don't think will be overwhelmed by the moment to start with. He's a good athletic boxer. I think he proved that against Chris Eubank Jr., Andy Lee, David Lemieux, I guess. Um, you could, he could give Alvarez some problems for a little while. In the end, though, this is my fear, uh, is that it's going to end up looking a lot like the Callum Smith fight. Um, Saunders can box, but he has, like, no power. Uh, I can see Alvarez walking him down, walking him down, and ultimately just kind of walking through him. Um, again, I could name a number of guys I'd rather see Alvarez fight than Saunders. Uh, I've written this a few times now. In my opinion, Alvarez is putting too much emphasis on titles and not enough on who he's fighting. Uh, he's just fixated on unifying the 168 pound titles, which I totally understand. It will, you know, goes back to the system. This is what this is what guys do. But then you end up fight end up with fights like this. Um, I hope he fights Caleb Plant in September because I think that's a real fight. Yeah, me too. And then I hope at some point David Benavides gets a shot. You know, maybe Jamal yeah. Charlo as well. I think I think those guys well, at those the very my, least. Yeah. They'll provide Sorry, some ahead. resistance. They're not yeah. gonna. They're not gonna lay down. I guess you know. Those are my. But, those are my dream. Those are the guys he should be fighting. That's my I, whole point. Yeah. I believe those fights will happen. Look, I understand what he's doing now. He says he wants to unify. You know, Saunders has a belt. Do I rate Saunders highly? Not really. Uh, he did have some decent wins at 160 pounds many years ago. Uh, 168. He's yet to fight a ranked contender. He's Mark good... Murray. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, that guy's obviously seen better days, uh, at least when uh, Saunders had fought him. And he wasn't even rated at 168. He was coming off that loss to uh, Hassan and Dom at 160. Sanders is just, Saunders, I should say, is just up and down with his performances. I mean, I think Canelo figures him, figures him out fairly quickly and uh, and puts him away. But then after that, hopefully we get into some of those big matchups. We will see. But just a quick update on the standings in our prediction league. I'm 6-1-1, one, one, Mike 5-2-1. That won't change this week, and the standings won't change, period, if I can help it. But we will <laughs> see what happens with that. It's time to bring in our next guest, one of the most exciting fighters in the sport, the former unified world super welterweight champion, Swift, Jarrett Hurd. Jarrett, first, I heard you're back home in, in Maryland. Did you see any of what, what hit Texas uh, over the past couple weeks? Oh yeah, man! I seen man. It had the power going out. Um, it started snowing out there. You know, Houston and Texas—they're not familiar with snow. And I mean, I got out of there just in time. You know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you know, everyone's able to be okay out there. But um, I was just coming home, just you know, taking a break. I haven't been home for so long, and I left at perfect time. Wow, it sounds like you've been in Houston training for some time now. What is it like uh, to be working with Kay Coroma down in Texas? Man, it's amazing. I mean, he got he got all the the fighters and all the work that you can imagine. Um, you know, people travel from in and out of, of the state of Texas. You know, I'm working with him, and uh, it's amazing being around the, the other champions and and fighters, getting the work that you're getting, and um, you know, just just him as as the person and the mindset he has. You know, been doing this thing since the working with all the Olympians coming up, you know, he has so yeah. much knowledge and uh it's 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 just uh, such such help for me because, you know, me I didn't come in the game with all the skills and uh you know, working with him, he teaching me a lot. Well wow. that that's great. Can you tell us uh what you guys have been working on specifically? Uh well you know, me, I'm the type of fighter that likes to go toe to toe, stand there and uh, you know, bang bang and and get my shots off if, you know, you land one, I'm trying to land three. And, uh, you know, he's teaching me more of a hit and not get hit. Um, you know, get my feet, footwork together. You know, a lot of times in there, I, I can sometimes shoot my shots and overstep with my punches, you know, and um, creating creating distance. Like, I like to fight close, close range, and, you know, we're working on a lot of distance. So, I mean, just, just all around um, boxing more and basically having longevity in the sport and not putting so much wear and tear on my body. At such an early young age, it now, sounds I like. Under, I, I, sorry, go ahead, um, go ahead. I was gonna say I understand that, but I was I was just thinking to myself as you were speaking that, um, I mean, you were unified world champion once. Do you feel like you still need some of your old style? Because I mean, it was successful for you against a lot of uh, big names. Or how do you marry the two the two worlds? Oh, listen, listen, listen. Um, because we're working on that, I still got that old <laughs> Jared. You know, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just you know, um, 
basically trying to get back to something that I got away from. Um, fight after fight after fight, I was walking guys down and using my size, um, using my engine, you know, to to, to overwhelm and, and and try to wear these fighters down. And um, you know, unfortunately, when, when I when I tried that in the Julie Williams fight, that just wasn't enough, and I needed to switch it up to Plan B, in which fight to use instead of fighting to try to wear them down. You know, get get back on my 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 jab and and use my skills, and that's what he's trying to get me back to, so I can also have an arsenal in my back pocket if I need it. So it sounds like you feel you're you're growing as an all around fighter. Yes. Fantastic. Definitely. Okay. Uh, you la- you last fought in January of last year, so it's a little over a year. Uh, you outpointed Francisco Santana. Uh, what were your thoughts on your performance in that fight? I mean, I love my performance. You know, the crowd didn't like it. They wanted to see the old Jared. But, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it was times I went in the corner. Me and my coach to laugh about today. And I was, sometimes it's times I went in the corner during the fight, and I asked him, man, can I just go in there and, and take him out? And he's like, no, man, we're working on something. I want, you to, I want you to get these rounds in. I want you to work on this. I want you to fight and win the fight this way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's what I did. It stuck to the game plan. He wanted me to go out there to work on what we were working on in camp. Even though I wanted to walk to him like I did the last couple of seconds in the last round, you know, I could have did that style up early, but I listened to my coach and started to the game plan. No, that was your first fight since uh, the setback against Julian Williams, which you mentioned. How far do you feel you've come since that disappointment, that fight with Williams? Uh, I think, I, I mean, you know, that was in the past. Um, I was going through a lot with my my previous coach at the time. Um, you know, I, I can make a hundred excuses on well, things that happened that night, but um, Julie Williams was a better man, and, you know, I moved on from it. Um, one day I told myself maybe i get the rematch. Hopefully I can, um, but I'm really looking for the, the world titles. Julie Williams, right after losing my hometown, he went his hometown and lost. Yeah. So he doesn't have a title right now, so I'm not sure if the rematch will happen. I don't know how long I can stay at 54, but while I'm here, I want to go out the titles. Now, you feel like the loss to Williams made you a better fighter? Based on what you're saying, it sounds like it, it did. I mean, yeah, it made me – I mean, I, I feel like if I fought Julian Williams the very next day, I would have won. Hmm. It's just that I went in hmm. the fight with the wrong game plan, and I didn't switch it up, you know. I just had my mind – focus on overwhelming to break him down until he got tired and you know not thinking that man this is the biggest fight of his career he's probably trained you know trained for this yeah. so he's he's not going to get tired and that's i just have him one track back to continue doing it until he does and next time i know 12 rounds was over so i mean you know i just for what it did was teach me not to go into a fight with just a game plan and just have multiple nice uh, looking forward, have you received any word on when you might uh, return to the ring? Uh, I was trying to get, uh, you know, I've been training, you know, I've been getting calls of staying ready, and, you know, this, that, and the other. I haven't got no exact dates. You know, I'm waiting. I've been talking to Al. Um, you know, he's trying to trying to put me on some cars. You know, he's trying to get me as a main event, trying to see some opponents for me. And he's trying to put something together for me, but he hasn't gave me an exact date or anything. But he just told me stay ready, and that's why, um, you know, I've been staying out in Houston to train it because uh, he said I'm gonna call my wife and stay by the phone because I'm setting you up something now. Nice. Would you Would you want a tune up given the time off, or would you rather just jump right back in and face, uh, you know, an elite opponent? Uh, with me, it's, the way I've been training, I'm staying sharp, so I'm ready for. Anyone, it doesn't matter right now, you know. Uh, I mean, a tune up if um, you, you mean by tune up, I'm not sure if you're saying like a um, not going for a fringe guy, I guess, uh, fringe contender, something, yeah, like that. yeah, French guy. But, um, you know, I, I'll take some, some big, some pretty big names if that's the case. And uh, what I really want to do is, you know, the fight I want, I want the child to fight, man. <laughs> okay. I think we all do. I mean, we we've seen a lot of back and forth between you and Jermel Charlo on social media. First, where where did that come from? I mean, you know, you know how Charlo is. He just he's on his Instagram live, just rambling, going off, 
And he just got to talking and saying, you know, you know why I heard is out in Houston. He's trying to be like me. He's trying to eat the same meat. We eat, we eat meat from the meat market. And I'm like, <laughs> he just rambling off at the mouth. And then I saw the video. Um, somebody tagged me and I'm in YouTube and things like that. of him talking. And you know me, I just went, on, went to, to, the, to the Kroger's where he said get the meat from. So I'm looking for the, the meat you was talking about, man. You just you say, I'm out here trying to be like you. And uh, that's how it all started, man. Well, you know, well, I got to ask, is it true that the meat markets and all that is better in Texas? Because I still go to Walmart, so maybe I'm doing something <laughs> wrong. I'm not sure you man. I'm familiar with Walmart, too, so I, I'm not actually sure. That's <laughs> funny. That's funny. Uh, Jermel has, has been on our podcast, and he says he still wants to fight you, uh, that he believes it's still a, a really big fight. Uh, when do you think that fight then could actually happen? Uh, hopefully this year, like I said, you know, um, it's, it's no matter, we know Brian Castano has the titles and, uh, and all that, and it can be become an undisputed champion 154. But to be honest, the biggest fight in 154 is me versus Jamel Charlo. And, um, you know, even though I had a setback with, 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 um, uh, uh, uh J-Rock and he, he lost to Tony Harris. He was able to revenge the loss. But, you know, it's still a lot of unanswered questions of who's really the best at 154 until we face each other. You just mentioned uh, Castaño, who just won a WBO belt. Um, and he says he wants Charlo next, too, obviously. Uh, if that fight, let's say that fight occurs, how do you see that fight playing out? Uh, to be honest, I give it to uh, Jamil. You know, um, Brian Castaño, he's a great fighter. I just think that, uh, you know, him being so close range in the height, his height, I think Jamil will be able to be on the outside and, you know, land some solid punches. And I wouldn't say stop him because I'm not, sh- I didn't see so many, too many fights on how good uh, Brian Castano chin is and how, you know, how, how uh, sturdy he is as a fighter. But I, I know for a fact that uh, Jamil should get the win. Now let's say let's say that does happen. Let's say Jamal goes for the undisputed. Um, who will be your your next three top targets in the in the division or another division if 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 that's what you are? If Jamil becomes undisputed, or if, let's say he says I'm going to fight Castano next. Who would who would you want to fight? Who would be like oh, your okay. top uh, three choices besides Jamil? Besides Charlo, yeah. Besides Charlo, okay. Uh, first of all. Like I said, I would love to get my rematch if I can with Julie Williams before I move up. Um, a fight with, uh, I mean, it don't matter. Uh, whoever's at 54, I can't. I, I basically, I fought them all. So all right. I, I'm trying to think, but, you know, right now, that it really doesn't matter. One thing for sure, I would love to get my rematch. Now, what about uh, this uh, Sebastian Fondura? He's more up and coming, but what's your take on him as a fighter? And and would that be something you're interested in? Oh, you talking about the tall, the, the yeah. giant, yeah. really yeah, the tall, giant. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's a, that's that's crazy how tall he is and the way he fights on the inside. Like uh, he he's 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 a. It'd be tough finding uh you know spawn partners and 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 different looks to to yeah. To, yeah, to, to uh, mimic him, but. You know, he, he's great, man. You know, I like it. You know, it's something exciting to see somebody so tall and, 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 and big in that weight class and the way he fights on the inside. He, he, he's a good prospect coming up. You you just you mentioned the possibility of moving up or the, the eventuality of moving up, I guess. How much longer do you plan to stay at 54, do you think? Uh, I told myself I'm going to stay here as long as I can. I just want to fight Jamil. <laughs> <laughs> but because because and I only say that because of the back and forth that we had, the things we were going through one fifty four and I don't wanna move up without those answers within myself, you know what I mean? I wanted I wanted to let the world know and see that I was the best hundred fifty four pounder before I moved up to one sixty. Hopefully it's not too far around the corner and if I had to do an estimate about how long prior today at one fifty four, I'll say for uh, maybe another year, and I'll move yeah. up. Okay. So you you sort of answered this question throughout the interview and just now, but can you just sort of summarize, kind of put it all together, what your goals are for this year, before the end of this year? Um, I definitely want to get at least two two fights in this year. Um, you know, starting off, I, I didn't fight since it's been over a year now, 
Um, hopefully I can get the fight three times a year, but we already, you know, started the year off. I'm at least want to get two fights in this year. Um, and another shot out of world title and, uh, you know, defend those, become undisputed, and move up to 160 and see big, bigger and better things. Jared, in, in closing, you know, you, you you didn't have a huge amateur background, but you've been a pro now for nearly 10 years. You've seen, you've seen the highs in the sport. You've seen the lows in the sport. What would you say this game has taught you? What, what are some of the biggest lessons you learned? Um, I would say as a fighter, um, you know, it told me a lot about myself. And, you know, it showed me that no matter what it is with anything in life, if you put your mind to it, you can do it, man. Um, I was that kid, like I said, that, that didn't have a big amateur background. Now, even though I was the world champion, I was still on the B side in a lot of people's eyes, but I always believed in myself. And I always uh, stay true to myself. And as long as I believe, I accomplish. So, well, it's been it's been great. We can't wait to see you back in the ring. I know the the fans are waiting. The fans have been waiting to, to hear from you. So, thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. Wish you and your family well, and we look forward to having you back on again soon. Most definitely, I appreciate you guys call. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. A few weeks ago, we examined three of the most controversial decisions in boxing history. Today, we're going to examine three more. In chronological order, Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad, Bernard Hopkins versus Jermaine Taylor, the first one, and Manny Pacquiao versus Tim Bradley, also the first fight. Now, speaking of first, the first on our list is Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad. Trinidad. September 18th, 1999, Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, the so-called fight of the millennium between two undefeated prime welterweight champions and a unification. Instead, it'll go down as perhaps the worst 12-rounder in the history of big fights. But a lot of folks were really upset at the decision. Trinidad won a majority uh, points win. Mike, I already know how you feel about this fight, but explain why to our listeners. Okay, so I don't want to get into a, another big argument over this fight, although I guess that's what we're here to, to do is to get into arguments. Um, I was at the fight. I have rewatched it several times. I know what I saw. Uh, I won't say that it wasn't a competitive fight in the end because, as everybody knows, De La Hoya gave away the last several rounds, so that sort of tightened the score a little bit. Here's the problem I have with, uh, and it's a big, big problem, with those who say that the fight wasn't a bad decision. There is no way in hell that you could find seven rounds to give to Trinidad, which is what he would need to win the fight. That's what it comes down to uh, comes down to, to me. It simply did not happen. I had it 116-112, eight rounds to four for De La Hoya. I can see giving Trinidad maybe one more round if you want to be profoundly generous to make it a 15-13, which I really can't see. I'm just being generous. But that's it. Just horrible, horrible decision. When you when you factor in the magnitude of that fight, what was at stake? It's one of the worst decisions of my career. You know, nearly all the pundits had De La Hoya winning, but nearly all of them had him winning by one or two points. So I, I tend to think that shows it was a close fight. I got to be honest with you. I rewatched the other two fights we're going to discuss. I couldn't bring myself to do the same for this one. And that's partially because of what transpired when I watched the first two, which is horrible commentary from Jim Lampley. And partially because the fight was so bad, I swore never to watch it again. I, <laughs> I believe I did one other time a couple of years ago, and, and that was it for me. I'm done with that fight for the rest of my life, uh, I hope. Look, the only people... And I've said this before, and I'll always say it. The only people who got robbed in this fight were the fans. 2.4 million people bought this pay-per-view. It was a record for a non-heavyweight uh, pay-per-view back then. And all of them deserved their money back. Oscar De La Hoya did not come to fight. I don't know what he came to do, but his game plan was well, terrible. Uh, you know, look, any game plan that leaves you completely fatigued after eight or nine, eight or nine rounds is a bad one. I've seen guys run out of the clock you know, before in the last round, not the last three. Quite frankly, he deserved to lose. And I can't imagine why anyone would argue that he deserved to win. Look, deserve is a strong word. 
And I believe justice was served that night as Felix Trinidad was rightfully awarded the decision. Now, real quick, as far as the fight itself, I get what you're saying. Sure, there was a long stretch where Oscar won the majority of the rounds. I thought the first round was close. I thought Trinidad clearly won the second round. And the seventh and eighth were tied too. 10 to 12 was all Tito. Uh, ninth round, I think, was Oscar's best round. But I also felt like it was his last gas. He could no longer stop to flurry after that because he was so gassed. He was feeling the punches and opted to run instead of potentially being knocked out. He also caught a big right hand in the ninth that no one ever discusses. And after that, he got on his Cannondale and, and took off. I mean, robbery, not a chance. Justice, I'd say so. Well, the what. The way- <laughs> I wouldn't put it the way I think I know what you're saying the, the, because if you just go by actually who won the rounds, I mean, in my, in my mind, it was, it was a horrible robbery, but what, what I wrote at the time, what I feel now is, is Oscar sort of gave away the right to complain about it by running the last, you know, three plus rounds. That's, that's the way I look at it. So it's like, Hey dude, if you're going to run for three and a half rounds or whatever it was, then you just shut up. Then, then you don't have a right to complain about it. You can't finish a fight that way. But I gave him, uh, eight of the first nine rounds. That was complete domination. I've, I've said this on the podcast. I don't remember who I was sitting next to at press row, but I said, I leaned over and said, uh, De La Hoya is making sure that looked like an absolute fool. He had no idea how to cope with what, De, with what De La Hoya was doing. And the guy agreed with me. And then all of a sudden he just stopped. He just stopped boxing. And, and that's how the fight got, got closer. But it was, that's, it, that's because they came in with two different game plans and one of them was better. It wasn't he. You, you don't he start. Absolutely... Fight, you don't wait for the other guy to stop fighting. He could never have predicted that. He didn't wait. He made the other guy stop fighting. Well, I mean, you know, I... the, the reality was that what other option did Oscar De La Hoya have? Keep boxing. I, well, why didn't he then? Well, one story is, is that one of that Gil Clancy told him you, you got the fight in the bag. Just just move now. He was uh, moving I have, already. I, I, I have no idea. You know what, Oscar? Oscar was uh, lived sort of a. Uh, I, I maybe this is a too strong return. He lived sort of a self-destructive, uh, had a had a self-destructive lifestyle. Meaning that he liked to party, he liked to go out late. Maybe his conditioning wasn't that great. I, I don't know. But but for nine round, eight plus rounds, he made a Trinidad look like an absolute fool. He, he he sort of like set the blueprint that that Hopkins and Winky Wright used. I mean, he, we shouldn't have been surprised at all. You know that that they dominated him the way they did because De La Hoya already did it, uh, and then he just. Again, he gave gave up the right to complain because he just stopped fighting. He can't stop fighting. I don't care what the reason is. He can't stop fighting. I, uh, I think the reason matters, and I think that's a key. It's key as to why Felix Trinidad won the fight. You know, I, I don't want to hear Oscar De La Hoya anymore about blueprints because he he swore that he gave the blueprint to beat uh, Floyd Mayweather to all of his fighters. They all ended up losing. He always has the blueprint to beat somebody, and it's based off his loss to that person. I, I, the reason but Oscar, why Oscar did better than anybody else against Mayweather, though. I I don't I don't believe that at all. Um, at all, I don't think that he did better than Maidana. I don't think he did better than Castillo. Um, I don't. I'm not convinced he did better than Manny Pacquiao. I I in. in just like this fight, he gassed, as he always does in his fights. He is sure to gas. Didn't gas against Corte. That was the one time he didn't. But think about all the other big fights that he had. Uh, uh, Fernando Vargas didn't gas. Uh, you know, I, I don't know why he stopped fighting. You know, again, it, again, and, and I'm with you. <laughs> when it comes to him, when it when it comes to him doing what he did at the end of the fight, I'm with you 100. percent Just like you do that, shut up. I don't want to hear about it. But I don't have. To, I don't have to. Agree with the decision, though. I'm not Oscar. I understand what you're saying, and yeah. uh, we'll we'll never agree with that. But as far as I'm concerned, I I I, I just could not make a case for Oscar De La Hoya winning that fight. No one won. The fans lost. As as far as I'm I get, what, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. No, we can go back and forth about that forever. Let's let's move on to the next fight on our list. This could be interesting as well. Bernard Hopkins versus Jermaine Taylor, July 16th. 2005 at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Hopkins was 40 years old at the time. The undisputed middleweight champion set to make his 21st title defense versus Jermaine Taylor, a powerful 26-year-old unbeaten rising fighter who many believe will be the next king. It was an intense 12-round battle, more intriguing than it was exciting. But in the end, Taylor would win a 12-round split decision. A lot of folks thought Hopkins won. Many thought Taylor deserved the nod. What saith Mike Rosenthal? Uh, I'm going to be as strident as I was on De La Hoya and Trinidad. I'm going to be wishy-washy on this one. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I scored it. I scored the fight round by round. I ended up with a draw. 
I, I thought Taylor was more active for the first eight or nine rounds, meaning he just threw more punches than Hopkins did. And I thought they basically landed at about a similar, uh, you know, percentage of their punches. Uh, Hopkins maybe landed slightly more eye-catching, harder shots. Uh, and I thought Hopkins came on late in the fight to, to pull even. Uh, I'm not even, I'm not quite sure what the controversy was about. I, I, I think 115 either way or a draw would have been perfectly acceptable. Uh, I definitely don't think Hopkins was robbed. Uh, he probably would have won had he been more active in the first half of the fight, but he was already 40 years old. I'm guessing he felt he needed to pace himself and then come on strong late in the fight, which he did. Uh, and I want to add, Taylor, Taylor looked locked in. He was a young, talented, hungry guy that night who came to fight. He did, and I thought he lost. I had Bernard Hopkins winning eight rounds to four. Ooh. I could see it seven to five, but I thought he won clearly. He uh, he swept the last three or four rounds, and and had it been a fifteen rounder, I think he might have stopped Taylor, who was just completely worn down and beaten up by the end. Yeah, uh, he came on. Uh, a couple notes on that fight: Jim Lampley's in his bias. The commentary was just oh, it was almost vomit inducing. I hate to say that because I love these guys growing up, but he was just unbearable at fights. And also, props to Roy Jones Jr., who showed immense patience dealing with his co-workers that night who just couldn't grasp what Hopkins was doing and were ignoring a lot of his good work. There was one point at the end of the fourth when Lampley was complaining about Hopkins for no reason that I could think of. And Jones said, I think he won that round. Uh, and a befuddle Lampley was like, oh, you think he won that round? And then also in the 12th, Lampley's like, Taylor's back is against the ropes. He's luring Hopkins in so he can trade. And Jones says, I don't think his back is against the ropes because he's trying to lure Hopkins in. I mean, it was just embarrassing. And, you know, and and I, I look, the uh, I felt the, the commentary and the pro Taylor crowd, you know, probably swayed a lot of opinions. I could understand why folks might choose uh, activity um, over efficiency, but but I really feel like Taylor faded badly in that fight and, they did. and Hopkins should have gotten the win. But I, I but I had uh, I had Taylor with a big lead after eight rounds yeah. though. So Hopkins ca- caught had to win those rounds to to draw even. Um, I don't know, 16-12 seems a little wide to me because I just didn't think Hopkins was active enough. Uh, I don't know. I thought it was close. 15, 13, either way or draw. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to get, I'd love to hear what the fans have to say about that fight. And I'd love to hear what they have to say about this one. Cause it is time for the last bout on the docket. The first fight between Manny Pacquiao and Timothy Bradley, June 9th, 2012 MGM grand garden in Las Vegas, Bradley, the former 140 pound titleist moving up against a legend in Pacquiao who appeared to be slowing down in his last bout, a controversial uh, majority decision win over nemesis Juan Manuel Marquez. This was a tactical battle between two savvy ring generals, but after 12, Bradley won a 12 round split decision to the chagrin of so many. I remember the WBO even had a review of the scoring where they concluded Pacquiao won the fight. Mike, how did you see it? Well, I have a real quick uh, story because that's a memorable fight night for me. Uh, I watched that fight with about 30 or 40 other people, including Desmond Howard, believe it or not, the Heisman Trophy winner, uh, at a friend's house in Canastota, New York. That was during Hall of Fame weekend uh, that year. Uh, So it was kind of fun. Uh, Everyone there, and I mean everyone, was aghast when the decision was announced. Uh, And after scoring it again, I still think it was a bad decision. Uh, I scored at 116-112 for Pacquiao, which I believe is actually a little closer than I had it at the time, but still a clear clear win for Pacquiao. I could actually see... I can actually see 15-13 for Pacquiao, but that's about as close as I can get to a Bradley win. Uh, I think Bradley was a little busier overall, but Pacquiao pretty clearly to me landed the heavier shots throughout most of the fight. I did think Bradley came on in the last several rounds when Pacquiao's output began to slow down a little bit, but I think he was in too big of a hole to catch up at that point. Uh, Pacquiao, you just you, you alluded to this, Pacquiao wasn't quite as dynamic as he'd been, uh, but he still had a lot of fight left in him that he still does now uh, at that time. Uh, and I have to say, uh, watching that fight fight reminded me how good Tim Bradley was. He yeah, was Tim Brad yeah. Tim Bradley was a special fighter. We shouldn't forget that, no yes. matter how we feel about this fight. Yeah, he certainly was. And uh, you know, Tim Bradley, I remember watching him on Showbox. Uh, I believe against Manuel Garnica uh, back when I used to write for Boxing News, and 
I remember he he dropped Garnica with the with the shot right hand. I was must have been about six inches um, from Garnica's face, and I just remember thinking, "Oh my goodness, this guy is going to be a great fighter." And it was so nice to see how he progressed. But upon further review today, I had Manny Pacquiao winning seven rounds to five. Um, again, I want to talk about how biased the commentary was and how off the uh, the punch stats were. Jeez, I mean, ugh, ugh to both of that. Jim Lampley, I get that he was always for the in-house fighter, but after watching these fights now, he's just, he was unbearable. Um, I don't know if it was a robbery, but I I think it's kind of tough to score this one for Timothy Bradley, quite honestly. Um, but thankfully, they did have... Uh, two more fights after this. I think Pacquiao sort of cemented his dominance in those two subsequent bouts, clearly winning both, although the second was fairly grueling. Um, but on this night, it's always strange when the more popular, bigger name, you know, loses a close decision. I just, I sometimes you just wonder. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I was, I was going to comment on the, the, uh, the lead uh, blow by blow uh, comments that you had made. You know what? I, I try never to really, take those comments too seriously. To me, it's just like a guy there to say, I don't want to sound disrespectful to anybody, especially Lampley, because um, I, I have great memories of Jim, both, you know, watching fights and also personally, he's a great guy. He's a real smart guy. Uh, it's nothing, I'm not, it's not about him personally, but I listen to the analysts. I don't really listen to the, to the blow by blow guy, because obviously that person's knowledge is limited. Yeah, I, I I listen to all of them. I none of it affects what I see. Uh, you know, I, I know it's the same for you, but I just think to myself at times. You take you know what they're saying and you combine it with maybe the crowd who's cheering every miss, maybe or or what have you, and you can see how uh, a person, particularly a newbie, could be swayed. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. By that, and it's and it's yeah. always you uh -huh. know it's disturbing to me. But I think on on this night we were all in agreement. Again, I thought it was a close fight. I thought Bradley made it close, and he really, he 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 had a great game plan. I mean, it was it was a smart smart fight. I think Pacquiao just had a a little too much for him on that night. And with that, that's gonna do it for this week's show. Remember to like and subscribe to the PBC podcast on whatever platform you listen to us on. We want to thank Jared Hurd and Vito Melnicki Jr. for joining us. And we want to thank you for tuning in. So for myself and Mike, be sure to check back next week for more boxing talk right here on the PBC podcast. <laughs> <laughs>